every day after school, I would walk past the record shop and I would go in and they had all the 45s, the top 100 were all slotted and they had the little record players where you could listen to them. So every once in a while I would go in, I'd look around and I'd listen to a record and back then they were 49 cents and you know, when I could save enough of my lunch money uh, to go in, I would buy one and take it home and play it. Um, one day the owner of the shop, you know, called me over and said, hey kid, you know, he says, you, you're in here every day. And I said, well, you know, I, you know I, I love music. And he said, do you want a job? And I was like, a job? He says, he says, I need somebody just to sit over here in this chair that they had in the back and just make sure that nobody takes anything. He says, come every day after school for two hours. And he says, at the end of the week, I'll give you 10 45s. My first experience at DJing uh, was at my father's bar. He partnered up with uh, with his brother in uh, in Jersey. You know, my father says, "Oh, you know, if you want to come downstairs? We lived upstairs and put records on. Uh, you can." And that's how I started DJing. You know, just entertaining people that were sitting there getting drunk all night long. Seventies, uh, when I was getting more involved in the DJing and the music, um, I always tell the story that the most pivotal record in everything I've ever done was Eddie Kendrick's "Stay with the Rain," uh, which was a song that was only uh, two minutes and thirty-two seconds, and I felt the need to find a way of making it longer. So I took a cassette deck, you know, that I had at home, and I kind of learned and perfected the ability to record and pause without creating any spaces in between the music and um, thereby ended up having a five minute version of uh, Date with the Rain. So I found a place in Manhattan uh, called uh, Sunshine Sound, where they would press uh, what they call these acetates out of your tapes. So I would take my cassette there, and um, the owner there, Frank, pressed it on a little 10 inch mono plate, and that's how I started, um, started that point of my journey. Probably around 79, 80, um, as you know, the stuff that I was doing was getting heard, um, I went to radio station WBLS and I met uh, Sergio Muzzabai there who was the assistant program director to Frankie Crocker. And I brought my mixtapes up there and they had a um, Friday night dance party, which was, uh, I think it was two to four, if I remember well, um, where they would play various mixtapes from DJs. And I started to get my mixtapes played on the station. And, you know, by virtue of always going up to the station to deliver my tapes, I became friendly with Sergio. And, um, and I told him at the time, I was like, you know, well, if, you know, if you want to come to the studio one day and see how we do the mixes, you know, you can come down. Uh, so what happened one day, Sergio called me and he said, listen, uh, Salso called and asked me to do a mix, you know, can you give me some help or, you know, so I turned him on to the studio, which is where I always worked, which was Blank Tapes, and the engineer Bob Blank, and the record was uh, Instant Funk's No Stopping That Rockin'. So I came down to the studio and kind of, you know, was part of the session. And, you know, by the end of the night, you know, we kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we get along, you know, we have similar ideas, let's start working together. And that's where Eminem was born in 1980. My goal with the Eminem mixes, especially the first volume, was that, that I wanted people to know 
some of the stuff that I had done that went unnoticed. And that, that was the initial reason that I wanted to do it because I felt that there was a history and that there was a story there that because of the time and just things that were going on, um, nobody knew. I mean, I, I, to this day, think that most of the records that I've done and that me and Sergio did together, people don't know. Because the interesting part of the work that we do, it's more behind, it was always behind the scenes. So unless you were a DJ or, you know, just a music aficionado where you actually looked at the record and read the credits, you would not know who I was. And even today, some 40 years later, you know, people still don't know. But here for the first time, I, I could show the, the covers to the vinyl for Eminem Mixes Volume 3. It's two pieces of vinyl. They're both double twelves. I mean, if you're an old school guy from back in the day who bought vinyl, there was no bigger high than to cracking a piece of vinyl and smelling it. I mean, I mean, this is what it was all about back in the day. I mean, can you smell that? This is serious. This is what it's, what it's all about. So th th this is what it's gonna basically look like. Eminem Volume 3, this is the vinyl. And the CDs are gonna look like this.